I work at a uh, small startup company in San Jose, California. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you a bit about is the, uh, the, the evolution of a new programming language, which uh, I was heavily involved with, and uh, its context as well. So, a little bit about Stardew, since I'm sure no one has heard of us. We're, we're a small company, we're focusing on, we have, a, we have a, a platform that focuses on building applications for what is <coughs> this week known as operational intelligence. Uh, next week it may be something different, I'm not, I'm not really entirely certain what will be next week. But essentially, uh, you know, there are two questions that most businesses need to be able to answer. What just happened? And uh, what do we do about it? And surprisingly, few businesses, surprisingly, many businesses don't know the answers to these questions. And we have a, we have a real-time emphasis. It needs to be done uh, with a reasonable facility. Okay, so <clears throat> the company started around 2002, and uh, the our original marketplace was in semiconductor manufacturing. So, uh, big companies like Toshiba, they, uh, <coughs> they, they have very large factories, which are very expensive, with large numbers of machines in them. And what Stardew was doing was uh, building monitoring systems to monitor the health of the equipment. So if you have a thousand plus uh, machines in your factory, then there's a thing that the machine itself is doing, but the machine has a computer attached to it, which itself uh, is monitoring uh, what's going on on the equipment, and you need to know how well everything's going. So, you know, typical installation had uh, 1,500 uh, machines, and we're collecting data from those machines on the factory floor and providing analysis. So I'll explain a little bit more about what that was for. Around five years later, just before I joined Stardew, uh, we realized that we needed to have a platform because it was too difficult to build new applications. It took a year to build each new application, which is not so good. And then last year, we launched our platform, <coughs> uh, of which uh, uh, the language I'm talking about is the core part, but not by, by no means the only part. So it has the core tech, the core event processing technology, and it has the IDE, and it has a programming language. So originally, this language Star Rules was designed to process events and has a very simple structure. If something has happened, then do something. And the typical kind of data stream was uh, what we refer to as time series data, <coughs> a series of temperature measurements then each temperature measurement is associated with a time period and we're just processing uh, vast quantities of this uh, all the time. In fact, there's so much that the central servers which are dealing with this data couldn't deal with every temperature reading. So there was a certain amount of processing done on the local nodes to aggregate the, aggregate the data. What we did with it, well, our customers, uh, they needed to know whether something was going to go wrong, mostly. And so we did a lot of forward projection of various kinds, looking for significant events. Relatively straightforward statistical analysis. We were not doing very heavy duty stuff. <coughs> uh, the other thing that we're doing is uh, kind of recognizing events in the, in the time series data. So, for example, <coughs> if uh, if the temperature changes in a certain characteristic way, then you can infer that the door opens on the equipment, or something else went wrong with the equipment, or some gas line is broken, or whatever. <coughs> Actually, the, the equipment that goes in the semiconductor uh, factory is so cutting edge that it's very, it can turn out to be very high maintenance and goes out of alignment very, very easily. So being able to tell when something is going out of alignment is, is quite important. But you have this analog data and you want to turn it to digital data, which is a core part of what event processing is about. But we wanted to do other things too. Uh, we wanted to enter the, the various kinds of financial services markets. 
um, we wanted to be able to not only monitor what was going on in the factory, but we would like to be able to do some more in the factory as well. For example, scheduling. The, uh, the traditional way of scheduling what goes on in a factory is uses a technique known as linear programming. Uh, the problem is that, are, that the scales are so large that, and, and that, that uh, you have linear you have models with, with millions of equations in them, and you can't solve these in an insufficiently short period of time. In fact, the mean time between failure of a plan, you know, in other words, whatever the best laid plans of the mice and men, if they fall over, uh, the mean time between failure of a plan was shorter than the time it took to make the plan. So by the time you had the plan, it was no good. So we were, we were pushing an approach based on uh, reacting to what was going on in the factory rather than trying to schedule everything out in, in advance. And this, from the, for the uh, semiconductor manufacturers, this was in fact radical in a, word, in a way that is difficult to appreciate. Um, <clears throat> These things could not be easily done using the, the kind of paradigm of on the then pattern recycling. We needed a stronger language. We felt that it was quite important that it would be multi paradigm so whatever kind of world you felt comfortable in, you could program in that world or you could work in that world. It also had to be extensible vertically, and I'm going to talk a bit more about this later, but having there are many kinds of ways that you can extend a language. You can extend it horizontally with new libraries. You can extend it vertically with new languages. It has to be safe and effective. It has to be. <coughs> it has to. You know. You, you, you want to. You don't want your program. You don't want your code to be the, the cause for the factory going down. The uh, daily depreciation rate of a typical semiconductor factory is measured about fifteen million dollars a day. So if you if your software causes the factory to stop working for a day, then you, you just lost them fifteen million dollars. That's quite apart from anything else. And it needs to be real time but not you know real time is one of those things that that, that is very, very difficult to quantify because it means different things to different people. And we basically felt that real time means however fast it is fast enough in order that that the, the, the result of what I'm doing can make a difference to what I'm trying to do. Okay, so <clears throat> there was this fork in the road that anyone coming up with a new programming language has. Uh, you know, do you do you make it tight or untight? And, and it's uh, it's a it's a genuine uh, dilemma. <clears throat> Uh, we decided to make star rules uh, strongly tight uh, for a number of reasons. We wanted it to be safe. Uh, we also felt that it improved the chance, you know, be easier to write uh, refactoring tools for a strongly tight language. Uh, and I think the other, the other main reason, the main driver, is that uh, we, we anticipated, and this, this is right, that, that most industrial software is not written by individuals, it's written by teams. And the more that you can provide to enhance communication between members of the team, then the, then the better off you'll be. On the other hand, we did not, we are a Java house, we've been, we, we program uh, a lot of the stuff that we do in Java, but we didn't want to incur the bureaucracy of Java, it's simply horrible. So we went for a type inference based approach, there were other choices that we had to make too. So for example, we chose algebraic types rather than objects as the basis. Uh, this was a difficult fight, by the way. Um, for Java heads, they love null pointers. They just do. Um, <clears throat> but recently, Tony Hoare uh, wrote in CACM that he felt that null, which he claimed to have invented in the 1950s, was the worst mistake of his career. And I actually agree with we also changed the name to STAR because it was no longer really rules oriented, <clears throat> as you'll see in a second. Uh, design influences, we sort of grab stuff from all over the place. Uh, the, the function, going to the functional 
programming style was based on the idea that, that simple let and, uh, and front higher order functions is an excellent uh, organizing principle for any programming language. Uh, <clears throat> but there are other things that we needed to do too. So we, you know, we come from a, a, a culture of uh, accessing databases and the, the natural semantics for databases is based on satisfaction rather than evaluation. Uh, which comes from SQL and from Prolog, the other way around. Um, we also took some other things from, from languages like from Haskell, like uh, type classes, which we renamed, since type classes is a very difficult name, for, diff diff difficult choice of terminology. We also picked up um, <coughs> the, the, the it was important for us to be able to build multiple layers of abstraction, allow other people to build multiple layers of abstraction using the star. And so we have a strong macro language. Uh, we have a rule-based compilation, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, something that's new that's happening is the coroutine uh, model for collaboration, <coughs> based, on, uh, based on concurrent ML, which in turn is based on all CSP. So uh, any, uh, any programming language's texture it's difficult to quantify this, but if you look at one line of a program, you can often tell what programming language is written in. And you all should know every one of these without me having to explain them to you. Um, and it, well, one line of code, you can tell what programming language is from. So, star has a texture also. And we, it was designed to be readable rather than concise, which annoys, annoys me too, by the way. It makes my fingers hurt. Um, you get used to that. Uh, it's very important. If you're working in a team, it's, it's very important for your coworkers to be able to read your code. It's important for the manager to be able to read the code without having to grok everything, uh, without having as easily as possible. It's important for customers to be able to read the code. It's important for the, for the owner of the software to be able to read the code. So readability was, was a very, uh, is and was a, a very important uh, factor for us. By the way, uh, the first thing here is a type definition, the second is a function definition. The third thing is an actor definition which is uh, something that's kind of novel in the start, too. It's not the same as, as fewer actors. So what are, the, what are the major features? Well, we've got static typing. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning, we, uh, <clears throat> I went into type classes as a way of uh, solving an overloading problem for arithmetic. This turned out to be a lot more powerful and a lot more uh, interesting uh, it's pattern oriented, <clears throat> and there's this notion of an actor and speech action. And speech actions are based on, on uh, speech act theory, and it's actually a way of talking about uh, collaborating in larger, granular, grained uh, entities than objects. Uh, the metaphor is that two people are talking to each other, and there's a common language that they use to talk. Um, so, a little bit about domain-specific languages. <clears throat> what, when we talk about domain-specific languages, we're less interested in, in running on parallel machines or particular kinds, of, particular kinds of, of target. We're more interested in the front end of that, which is uh, ways of expressing policy. So, if you have any large application, you can, you can characterize it in terms of bunch of mechanism and some policy that's used to drive the mechanism. And uh, if you program in Java, then the, then the, the language of the policy is typically XML, uh, which is horrible, uh, and doesn't fit very well with Java. So what we want to be able to do is allow people to, to write policy languages in STAR in a natural way that integrates with the world. But if you if you're thinking about, if you think about the poor guy who has uh, has been told by his boss, you've got to write a new DSL. 
sell for us. And uh, he says, okay, now what do I do? Uh, it's related to the business, so I, we can't do it for him. Uh, but what we can do is give him some idea of how he should proceed, he or she should proceed. And I think there's a, an interesting methodology that starts with ontology, it starts with figuring out what, what are the key things in your system. You identify the verbs and the objects, and then you go to the lower level and you find actions and statements. And you finally then crystallize what your policy language is really trying to do. Now this, this part isn't in star, but it is a crucial, it is a crucial precursor to what you then have to do. Then star can give you technology to help the next phase of it, which is the implementation. So we have uh, uh, we have an extensible grammar and um, in the same way that Perl is extensible. Uh, you can then write use the macros and the and the validation rules to uh, to uh, reduce that to a regular language. And you then this is, this is once again where, where contracts come back in that the implementation of these functions is often backed by the critical contracts that allow you to have some substitutability at the lower level. And then you implement the contract for the different ways that you want to do so. This is actually a very nice methodology from beginning to end for how to develop a completely new domain specific language. Okay, so here's a significant uh, uh, program, <coughs> Chatty Actors. Uh, the, the, what's going on here is the <coughs> So there are two actors, uh, and in fact they're identical in this in this example. They have an ear which they, to which they listen, on which they listen to things. Uh, when you talk to an actor, you you can do it in a number of different ways, but a simple way is to notify the actor that something has happened. So remember, it's the bent kind of orientation. <coughs> so you want to notify them, and then uh, you have. Uh, you have a way of responding to that, uh, and, the, and in this case, they, they respond by telling their partner. Okay, I will uh, <clears throat> try and accelerate a little bit here. Coming back to our core, we needed to be able to come, we had this new language, we need to be able to implement what we were in business for. So we have uh, this, this model of a bunch of the incoming events. They can, they, the, the kind of event can be very varied. It, it, it's, it's, but in the, in, the, in the context of a real factory, it is often, as I said earlier, this basically continuous function that you're measuring. And you're interested in buffers and buffer computations. And so the way that we do this is we have a, a, an analytics actor <coughs> There's a special kind of actor that has a special syntax, it's not part of the core language. Um, and this, this bit here, the, between the when and the do, is an event condition. It's not, uh, it says that when some average, uh, when some standard deviation is greater than three times the average, which is kind of a statistical way of, of signaling a bump in, the, uh, in your data, then I, then I'm, then I'm So, and then when you talk to the actor, you talk to the actor with the notification. There are, in fact, three kinds of speech actions, but I've only shown the one. And uh, that is it. So, it is uh, available today. Uh, it is still a rough and ready, still, there's still uh, definitely uh, issues to be addressed. Um, not, uh, ultimately, it probably will end up in sort of completely open source, but it's in, it will not be today. And I, I suggest if you don't have, uh, I suggest that you contact me directly. Uh, so our website is still a little bit rough. Thank you. And